Before considering the Archbishop's paper in any detail, there are three general points I want to make about the way the debates about sexuality and the advocacy of the covenant have been conducted in the Church of England. They're not new points, as I've said, and it's sad and unexpected to find myself having to make them in relation to the Archbishop's paper. The first point is that it is customary, and that paper is no exception, to preface statements of the Church's, quote, traditional teaching, unquote, and the dangers of authorizing blessings of same-sex unions or ordaining partnered gay people with strong denunciations of homophobic behavior or attitudes of any kind. In making such denunciations, I suggest, it is necessary, as well as being passionate, also to be honest. For in that paper, these denunciations of homophobia are made without any reference to the fact that the Archbishop was personally responsible for a decision, I refer of course to his requiring Geoffrey John's withdrawal from his acceptance of the See of Reading, a decision that was personally hugely painful and damaging. While I don't know any gay person who doubts <coughs> Archbishop Rowan's personal sincerity in making these statements against homophobia, I know many who say that their situation in the church is far worse than it was during his predecessor's time. Something paradoxical, to say the least, but for which the Archbishop surely needs to own some responsibility. Expressing horror at overt homophobic acts is only a part of what we need to do. We also have a responsibility to acknowledge the distress that is being inflicted on LGBT people by the teaching that is being proclaimed and the characteristic style of the debate. In particular, when the Archbishop says that there must be no questioning of LGBT people's human or civil rights or of their membership of the body of Christ, it needs to be said that what he is questioning has serious implications for both. I shall not forget the occasion when a bishop who is unmarried wrote to me after the article I wrote dissociating myself from the statement of the House of Bishops on civil partnerships, he wrote, being celibate doesn't make you acceptable. There is another difficulty about the I am totally opposed to homophobia but line of argument. It is that the evidence is so strong as to leave no room for doubt that homosexuality is the battleground chosen by people who call themselves traditionalists, seeking to halt what they see as liberal control of Anglicanism, rather than, say, the ordination of women or marriage after divorce, chosen precisely because of the visceral responses which homosexuality arouses and the energies they allow to be tapped. If homophobia is contrary to the intention of those advocating the traditionalist cause, it has been allowed to provide a good deal of the fuel for the debate, and the Archbishop's personal opposition to homophobia does not exempt him from complicity in the way that energy is being used. My second general point refers to the way in which the Episcopal Church is referred to in these discussions and debates. When the Bishop of Durham first advocated the, the covenant of the General Synod, an experience to be likened to sitting under a verbal power shower, <laughs> I said then, as passionately as he did, though not, I think, quite as quickly, that I thought it was very unlikely that the Episcopal Church would make a positive response, given the total lack of empathy that was shown towards it in documents and speeches. By empathy, I'm not meaning some kind of emotional sympathy, but a real understanding of the political and constitutional history, distant and recent, which provide the cultural context within which American Christians generally, and Episcopalians in particular, live out and express their faith. I speak with the passion of someone whose theological formation happened in the USA remembering well being taught that Cardinal Spellman, 
the then leader of United States Roman Catholics, was essentially an American Protestant, whether he liked it or not. Such is the character of the American religious inheritance. For me to say that does not at all commit me to supporting every bizarre theological utterance of every bishop in the Episcopal Church, or every aspect of the way the Episcopal Church has handled controversial questions. It is to say that unless there is some evidence that we really think the presence of Americans of all views in our communion is an enrichment giving grounds for thanksgiving, it's hardly likely that our demands on them will be received positively. The Archbishop's opening warm comments on the Episcopal Church carry little weight if most of his thoughts are actually directed against it. <coughs> it needs to be said also that as is shown by the strong American critique of the Episcopal Church in the paper I mentioned called the Anglican Covenant Shared Discernment Recognized by All, opinion within the Episcopal Church is deeply divided and it is that division within the Episcopal Church which, arguably, has been projected outwards onto the Anglican Communion. That brings me to my third observation uh, about the way in which the debate about sexuality and the Covenant are being conducted before I come to the Archbishop's paper in detail. My third observation is another feature of the Archbishop's paper which echoes a characteristic way in which we are conducting ourselves in the Church of England in these debates. That characteristic, and I say this about the Archbishop only with fear and trembling, is what can only be called a massive lack of cultural self-awareness. The fact is that we who criticise the Episcopal Church for collusion with its surrounding culture, represent one of the most successfully enculturated churches in Christendom. Specifically, those of us who are bishops or archbishops speak in the manner of the Queen's bishops and archbishops that we actually are. We speak in that way, we think in that way, we behave in that way, and have very successfully, with the exception of the case of the USA, exported these thoughts and ways of speaking and behaving to other parts of the world. I'm not ashamed of being the Englishman that I am, only laying upon myself and others the requirement that I notice and learn from the impression of others, the ways in which I conform to type. The fact is that the way in which we are behaving and seeking to get others to behave in the matters in dispute is not different from what Brits have always sought to do. It's been the secret of much of our national and missionary success, but there are glaring shortcomings in all of that, one of which is that we're not very comfortable with ideologies that have emerged <coughs> in opposition to centuries of European monarchical history. And of course that history has conditioned many of the assumptions behind dialogue with Rome to something which has a very high priority, clearly, to the Archbishop, but for others too, including me. 